This episode of The Unstarving Musician is powered by Liner Notes. Learn from the hundreds of musicians and industry professionals I've spoken with for The Unstarving Musician on topics such as marketing, songwriting, touring, sync licensing, and much more. Sign up for Liner Notes at unstarvingmusician.com. It's an email newsletter from yours truly in which I share some of the best knowledge gems garnered from the many conversations featured on The Unstarving Musician. You'll also be privy to the latest podcast episodes and liner notes subscriber exclusives. Sign up at unstarvingmusician.com. It's free and you can unsubscribe at any time. This is The Unstarving Musician. I'm Rabonzo. This is my podcast. It features conversations with independent music artists and industry professionals with relevant special topic episodes featuring yours truly, all intended to help independent music artists better understand the marketing, business, and creative processes that empower us to do more of what we love, make music. (laughs) That was pretty close. You guys who listen often know I'm always trying to nail that little spot where I say, make music, right in the pause of the guitar. Anyway, I almost got there. If you love what I do here on The Unstarving Musician, by the way, please consider supporting us. You can support The Unstarving Musician in many ways. You can follow us on your favorite podcast app. You can share the podcast with a friend. You can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Or you can visit unstarvingmusician.com forward slash crowd sponsor or the show notes for this episode to learn the many other ways of offering your support. And I appreciate it. So yes, welcome to another episode, and thank you for tuning in. How are things in your world? Are you happy? Are you feeling creative today? In any case, I hope this episode makes things better, or even better, whichever feels applicable. I'm playing a house concert in a beautiful amphitheater tomorrow. I'm looking forward to meeting the host of the house concert. It's going to feature two bands, including my blues ensemble, Yuvia Azul, and an open jam of locals. It's all happening in the town of San Miguel de Allende, or San Miguel as I call it. That town apparently has quite a scene of blues players, so it should be really fun. This is a Rewind episode and features author and music journalist Zach O'Malley Greenberg. What is a Rewind episode, you may ask? It is an abridged version of a prior episode intended to hone in on something I found particularly interesting and worthy of repackaging. This rewind comes from episode 226 of the podcast. Zach is also featured, the featured guest of episode 149. He writes a great deal about music business within the hip-hop celebrity world. He says in the introduction of his forthcoming book, We Are All Musicians Now, that Artists are canaries in the coal mine of modern business, experiencing seismic tech disruptions years before those in other industries. In this Rewind edition of our conversation, Zach and I discuss the relationship between indie artists and fans, the rise of superfans, NFTs, teachings from hip-hop, and the rising significance of intellectual property. While NFTs and intellectual property may seem a bit esoteric in the world of independent music, Zach relates them to not only independent music, but the possible futures of music and art. See the show notes for links to Zach's prior appearances on the podcast, or simply visit unstarvingmusician.com and search for Zach O'Malley Greenberg. And now, here is the rewind version of my conversation with Zach O'Malley Greenberg. I want to read the premise here really quick and just say how much I love it. So artists are, this is a quote from from your book or introduction, but um, artists are canaries in the coal mine of modern business, experiencing seismic tech disruptions years before those in other industries. Follow the music, see the future. That's it. Super nice. How do you think this relates to, you, you write about the super successful artists, but I know you know their stories in the beginning too, but how does this relate? How can the indie musician that's still on the cusp of or trying to get to that point of making a decent living with their music, how do they wrap their endeavors into this theme and what you're going to be writing? Yeah. So, well, you know, that that brings me to the chapter that I'm currently working on, which is all about super fans. And I think that's kind of the place where I would direct 
uh, indie artists too. And I think that's one of the really fun things about writing this book is, is I can kind of dig down a little bit more into some of the stuff that would be more relevant to indie artists as opposed to, you know, writing a book about Michael Jackson or Jay-Z. It's like, okay, cool. If you're, you know, if you, if you have the, the musical gifts of uh, Michael Jackson or the, or the business acumen of Jay-Z or, you know, but like you can't really teach, you can't, can't necessarily like teach that so easily, you know, so some of it, maybe you're just, you're born with it. But, you know, I think certainly with accumulating super fans, you know, that's a thing that, that any up and coming artist, any indie artist can really focus on. And, you know, also like any business, but that's a whole different thing. I think that one of the, one of my favorite stories um, that I've gotten from interviewing artists for, for this book is from Amanda Palmer of the Dresden Dolls. You know, she went independent, set all kinds of records on Kickstarter, went over to Patreon, you know, so she's sort of like poster child for, you know, super fans, right? I mean, mm -hmm. and Patreon. her whole career. Yeah, Patreon. I mean, Patreon is, that's what it's all about. And so I was interviewing her and, you know, she called in from New Zealand uh, where she's been since her tour uh, stopped in Wellington like a year and a half ago. She just kind of decided to stay. She liked it there. But uh, but yeah, she she said, I hate the word super fan. I said, what do you mean? She said, um, you know, it suggests sort of like that you're on a different level from from your audience. And she said, the thing that really gets people interested and, and wants, you know, makes them sort of want to stick around and become patrons is is this idea of sort of a peer to peer relationship if you if you have that people will support you you know to, to the ends of the earth i mean in in her case to all the way to new zealand and you know when her tour um kind of went kaput because of covid and you know she was stuck on the other side of the planet solo parenting um her little kid uh, and, and couldn't really record and, and release music in the way that she wanted to her, her super fans came through and and continued to support her and you know i mean she she started a podcast and did a bunch of other things that were a little more conducive to, to the time that she had available but but she said you know my super fans really saved my life i mean in in a world without universal basic income and and, and stuff like that i mean there's no safety net uh, especially for, not for, for independents like her you know exactly artists. yeah Exactly. And so, you know, one of the points that I'm making in this chapter is that for an indie act, um, super fans can be your UBI, right? I mean, uh, they can, once you kind of cultivate that one-to-one peer-to-peer relationship, and you begin to form this base and, you know, it, it's not going to, yeah, you know, it, it may not be enough to, to, to buy that house that you always wanted to, but it, it could get to the point where it's enough to to pay your rent and give you sort of like some security so that you could go off and, and maybe take some more risks, you know, to, to take some big swings that, that could eventually get you to where you want to be. Yeah. And, you know, I've actually spoken to an artist here on the podcast. Uh, her name's Shannon Curtis, and I, I call her the house concert queen. She's made her huh? living on recording annually, you know, making a new record annually and then going out on the road and doing house concerts, which obviously proved mm. interesting with um, COVID. But right. uh, sh she and her partner really detest the word fans in general, and I'm sure super fans are there. Super, they super detest. And it's because, I guess, in a yeah. similar way to... Um, Amanda and said differently they look at them all as just supporters and and I can totally see that I mean when you're building a, an audience or have an audience in there uh, moving you along like the story you just told about Am Amanda Palmer um, that's really what they are but hey man you know conceptually I think it works really well super fan because it sort of defines a point for us all that are you know trying to understand how you get uh, a beachhead on your audience right yeah, absolutely. I mean, and it's, it's, um, you know, what's the saying? All you need is a thousand true fans mm -hmm. um, of whatever it is. I mean, you know, if you have a thousand fans that are willing to pay you, I don't know, I mean, uh, five bucks a month to, to produce whatever it is that you produce, you know, you, you could, you can probably get by, um, you know, depending on a number of things in your situation and, you know, but where you live, you know, maybe not in certain <laughs> maybe not in New York so easily, or maybe not if you have family, but you know, there's a, there's a, if you get to a thousand, a thousand true believers, you know, um, a lot starts to become possible. And then, you know, on top of that, ideally you're, you're growing it. And that's, and that's the beauty of the super fan economy is that 
every super fan you create is is also an advocate they're you know they're kind of a, a johnny appleseed going around and you know and spreading the um it, you know, I'm, I'm mixing all my metaphors here but johnny appleseed spreading the gospel but you, you know you, you get the idea it's like at some point you know they're like your your street team exactly. they're out there you know getting you new super fans and um and then it starts to just build on itself and and that's how you know you start to build something like amanda palmer or hansen or, or some of these other ads have do you feel like the rise of the super fan happened or really got illuminated with patreon or how do you see it as as having happened well i think it was always there right um i think patreon just tapped into something really really huge you know i i also think that they're you know sort of in, in our new internet economy uh you know the web 1.0 2.0 3.0 wherever 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 we are in all these different iterations it has enabled people you know acts uh, you know bands but also all kinds of creators with smallish audiences but like big enough to to survive around the world to kind of stitch that together regardless of location so you know let's say somebody like um you know, I don't know. Uh, I mean, Amanda Palmer does have a, a pretty big audience at this point, so maybe she's not a good example. But there, there are acts out there who have, you know, a thousand true fans, let's say, but there might be, you know, 50 in New York and 50 in Stockholm and 50 in Beijing and mm -hmm. 50 in, in Johannesburg. And, you know, you can't get them all to come to a show. And even if you go to, to all those different towns, I mean, obviously travel and, you know, you're playing shows in front of you know, maybe only... 10 of those 50 people can make it, you know, it just doesn't work for, from a touring perspective. It probably doesn't work for, you know, from like a, a record deal perspective, but if they're all willing to pay you five bucks a month, it doesn't really matter where they are. Now that we have that connectivity, I, I think that it, it kind of enables this middle class of musicians to, to really rise up and, and to be able to have sustainable businesses in a way that wasn't possible before, before we had, you know, before everybody was online. And I, th I think a lot of, Musicians, independent uh, musicians are at all levels are curious about NFTs. How, how does your book tackle the or how do you anticipate tackling yeah. the, the subject right now? Well, the, the first thing I wrote about NFTs was how I thought that the, the Once Upon a Time in Shaolin, the Wu-Tang album was actually the first NFT. And of course, it was a, a very physical thing. So in that way, it's different from an NFT. Uh, but the idea of a, a one of one album, you know, limited, talk about limited edition, there's only one. And I actually broke the story of that album's existence for Forbes back in, uh, I think it was 2014. Okay. And it was this whole crazy process where I was contacted by the producer of the album. And I didn't know, you know, I'd never heard of the guy and it was from this weird email address. And I thought it was some kind of scam. And, you know, what a, what a crazy idea. He's just like, we've had the secret Wu-Tang album that we've been recording for six years and it's in a vault in Morocco. And it was, it was so wild that I concluded it, it would have been very hard to make up. And so I kind of kept going down that rabbit hole, you know, ended up out in, in Marrakesh, like listening to the album and, you know, like see, seeing how, how they had produced the physical casing of it and, and, and all this stuff and, and really becoming immersed in it. And then, of course, the album kind of took on a life of its own, got bought by the, the pharma villain Martin Shkreli, uh, got seized by the government when he went to jail, um, sold, she ended up in the hands of, of a DAO. Uh, you know, so it's, I, I think that the idea of creating that one of one album, you know, they, they wanted to re elevate music to the level of fine art, you know, or sculpture, something like that. I think really in the process, they, they predicted NFTs, you know, um, Nipsey Hussle also did that. I mean, you know, maybe even better example was his hundred dollar mixtape that he only made a thousand copies of. That's a limited edition. It's like, that's an NFT drop, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and it took, you know, maybe six or seven years for the rest of the world to catch up to, to that. But, um, you know, I, th I think for me, that was kind of the focus, uh, the initial focus of, of NF the sort of NFT part of the uh, of the equation. So, you know, NFTs, I, I don't really know. I mean, what where we're going with that, it seems like we're moving toward, you know, a long-term play being something like the NFT as a certificate of authenticity for, for a physical work, right? Like, yes, this is really only 
one of 1000 Dipsy Hustle mixtapes. And, you know, you can have the real thing and you can have the certificate that you could post online. Um, you know, I, I think that's kind of, that's where I would see it uh, going. But, you know, uh, I think especially as we move into things like the metaverse and a lot of things that, that could be technically infinitely replicable, people will want methods of, of saying, no, this is really one of only a limited amount of things um, of this type of thing created. And I think that's kind of where the technology of NFTs is going to be um, most popular. And it sounds like there's some really interesting lessons then in the history that you presented just now and, and that you, you'll present in the book for NFTs and the whole idea for the small independent musician as well, um, whether or not they explore actual NFTs or what we, we're calling NFTs now and, and all that's behind that, both time and cost and all those things. But it uh, sounds like some great lessons. Yeah, for sure. You've spent most of your time, arguably, it, with um, as far as music goes and looking at what hip hop artists have done. What do you feel like they're teaching us now and what have those guys and gals uh, learned along their journey in your opinions? Yeah. I mean, hip hop is such a huge part of, you know, everything I write about, uh, especially in this book. Yeah. Well, I don't know, not, maybe not especially because I've written books specifically about hip hop and this is, right. you know, hip hop is, is one of many genres mentioned, but, you know, probably the genre most prominently mentioned. And I think the, the lessons are really um you know, when you look at hip hop coming up out of the South Bronx in the 70s, you know, and then into sort of like the commercial adoption of hip hop and, you know, throughout the 80s and 90s, a lot of the entrepreneurship that happened in hip hop was sort of by necessity. If you look at, let's say, somebody like Jay Z or Diddy um, launching a clothing line or a record label, I mean, Jay-Z launched his record label because nobody wanted to buy his record. Um, they thought it was too dangerous or, you know, there are all kinds of things that people say when they're not wanting to say what they really mean. When, when you're looking at institutionalized racism, all kinds of prejudice that Jay-Z had to overcome, you know, in, in selling his music. I, I think that same goes for the commercial aspect. When you look at something like Rock Aware, he founded that because he wanted to do an endorsement deal with this Italian sportswear company called Iceberg. And they sort of laughed him out of the room. So he went and started his own. And, and that, that kind of, you know, if, if you, you encounter a closed door, you, you go and you go around and you just build your own house. Like that's, that sort of hip hop, that that's how it's always been done. And I think those lessons are, are valuable, you know, even for, for people, who could get through the front door, right? Um, it turns out that the idea of ownership, the idea of, you know, creating your own whatever is ultimately a lot more satisfying and valuable um, than, than sort of doing it the, the old way. So th there's a great saying um, that I hear a lot of the pioneers of hip hop say, which is we didn't invent anything. We reinvented everything. <laughs> And I really love that saying. And I think their point was, you know, there are all these, you know, the spoken word has been a thing for a really long time. You know, beats obviously have been a thing for a really long time. And, and you sort of put it all together, but it, you, you create something new. You create something um, totally novel and, and, you know, a movement uh, in its own right. And, you know, I think that's definitely been one of the lessons of hip hop. Interesting. One last thing I wanted to ask about, and then if there's any like kind of closing things you were hoping to talk about, let me know. But intellectual property, blah. intellectual <laughs> property. Why um, is that? Why are the lessons, or what are the lessons that you're honing in on, or what do you think they should be right now, where these worlds collide, business and art, and and so forth? Yeah, I think that just as we move into a world where everything is online, um, and not only just in the way that you would go on a computer and, and, and you know, check your email um, or read the news. But, you know, this idea of immersive online experiences, the metaverse, stuff like that. I mean, what is it but intellectual property, right? You know, ideas are the new currency, not that they weren't always valuable, but I think they're just extra valuable. And especially in the world that we're living in, where anything unique 
is more and more valuable than it was a couple of years ago due to a number of factors from inflation to just sort of the general direction of the economy. I mean, you look at baseball cards and sneakers and homes and raw materials, used cars, everything, everything that is, I mean, I guess used cars aren't even that unique, but anything that is finite and, you know, um, is going up in value. And so I think it stands to reason that intellectual property um, above all is, you know, is the most unique. I mean, we've been talking about NFTs and, you know, limited edition releases and stuff like that, but the value of a unique idea, you know, it's, it's a one of one. And I think that, you know, that people, creators who, who have those unique ideas, those unique concepts and creations um, just need to, to find ways to protect that because ultimately that that's, I think that's going to be the most valuable thing out there. If you do not yet have a website for your music, check out Bandzoogle. It was created to help musicians and bands build their website and manage direct-to-fan marketing and sales. Bandzoogle features amazing design options, a commission-free store to sell merch, music, tickets, and you get detailed fan data. And there's more. Try it free at Bandzoogle.com. Use the promo code Robonzo, that's R-O-B-O-N-Z-O, to get 15% off your first year. You've been listening to The Unstarving Musician with Robonzo. That's me. Please follow us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. You can find links and mentions for this episode at unstarvingmusician.com. Thanks again for listening. Peace, gratitude, and a whole lot of love.